Hey everybody, this is part two of our Drive to School podcast with David Zills on truth and meaning. Check out part one in the comments below if you haven't already listened. So, so how do we start to deal with then the intersection of, of truth and meaning in a world that is hostile to it? Yeah, that is a great question. I think, uh, um, I think one thing is to realize um, is to not separate truth and meaning. You kind of got at this where I think this is something our culture does. Um, truth, objective truth is something that at least when I was growing up, you know, that's science, you know, something that is empirical, experimental, um, mathematical, quantifiable, that is where truth is. And if it's outside of science, then it's not objective. It's kind of uh, whatever your opinion is goes. And so sometimes thinkers will call this the fact value dichotomy, where you drive a wedge between fact, which is knowable, objective truth, and that's where science lives, and then value, which is, you know, moral judgments and purpose and things like that. And our society has kind of said, you know, fact Mm -hmm. is scientific, but science doesn't talk about morality and purpose and the things that make life worth living. And so those are things we're supposed to construct for ourselves. And, you know, however, however we want to do that, no one else can judge because there is no objective standard. And so there's this idea of total freedom to construct a meaning myself. Um, And that drives a wedge between truth and meaning. And the problem with that, like you said, is that if you have a comfort that's a false comfort, it's not going to end well. You know, it's got to be grounded in reality with who we are, with real human nature. Um, But if you have a truth, you know, a scientific truth, or maybe a theological truth that's just abstract and doesn't speak to the real issues of everyday life, then it might be academically interesting, but like, why bother when the rubber hits the road and life gets hard? And so I think, I think you need both together. I, there's this book by Donald Miller that I really like called Searching for God Knows What. And I, I really recommend that book. I read it at about the senior and high school age. And he talks about how he, he told God as a teenager that God didn't exist, which is funny because he was telling God that God didn't exist. <laughs> so, um, but he, he basically um, had a very formulaic Um, superficial faith that was kind of, you know, you check the box. Um, And so as he kind of went and lived life, he realized, um, you know, the the storyline, the overall storyline of the Bible, not necessarily specific compartments of theology, but the overall storyline actually says a lot about who we are as people. And something he said in that book is, this, I believe the separation of truth and meaning is a dangerous game, and Christians are guilty of it too. Sometimes we talk about truth as like right and wrong belief and right and wrong behavior, and we don't address, you know, Jesus said, if you follow my teaching, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So if truth feels like a straitjacket, it's not the truth that Jesus offers. And Jesus said, um, you know, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full or in abundance. And so if we don't have this fullness and this freedom, then the truth isn't the kind of truth Jesus wants to offer, which is not only grounded in reality so we can have confidence, but it's also comforting and it actually addresses the needs of, of life. That's fantastic. Um, and there's there's an old theological term for this too. This was something that we actually wrestled with uh, even before uh, all of sort of the modern age. We, we talked about um, in Latin, it's fetus qua and fetus quae. The, the idea that there is a, a confessed faith and a personal faith, and these actually do need to match. So like you can say, I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, just like the, the creed has taught you to, but if you don't actually believe in it, there's no real comfort for you. They're just words. It, it's it, They're true. They, they, they are demonstrably true beliefs, but at the same time, if there's no comfort in the heart, then, then there's no hope. And at the same time, you can have a great personal hope, but if it's not going to be founded in something that is real, well, like I, I've been to funerals before where people look really, really happy. And, and you ask like, why are you happy? And then they tell you what they believe and, and it has to do with crystals and whatnot. And you're like, oh, honey, no, um, I know that you feel good about that, but um, we actually do want the the uh, apostolic faith to match up with, with your faith. And that's a faith that actually 
exists inside of the world so much that it doesn't need to be guarded in your heart. I wonder if um, one of the reasons that that we have sort of personalized this to this like heart faith, this this my personal beliefs is that we we don't feel like it actually can stand up to pressure from the rest of the world. And so if I can sort of guard it in my heart, it becomes my heart's job to protect my faith instead of my faith's job to protect my heart, which is bad. But it also leaves a, a faith that um, never really can actually stand up to outside pressure, can only retreat. Yeah, I think uh, I know in the American church, there has been a side to American Christianity, not just in the Lutheran church, but more broadly, that has defined faith in terms of personal experience. And it's kind of a strategic move in some ways, because if it's personal experience, no one else can question it. Um, the problem is then if no one else can question it, what happens when you question it? Um, cause if it doesn't stand to scrutiny, you can say, well, is my personal experience, valid. is it, is it valid? And what if someone else has a totally different personal experience? Who's right. And, you know, are, are we both right or are we both wrong? And these are questions that when you overly personalize, it can, it can, um, it can, you can lose the confidence and the objectivity that you need to just have, you know, something reliable to stand on. Right. So if we're kind of wrestling then with truth and meaning with, with our faith, if we're, we're sort of at, at a, a college or a high school where it's getting pushed on, like, what are some questions we can ask to kind of internally reorient and organize our, ourselves? Yeah. So I think uh, on the truth question, um, where I really got started making traction is by going back to Pontius Pilate's famous question, what is truth? Mm-hmm. And you kind of say, you know, let's not, let's not assume anything about the Bible. Let's not assume it's the word of God. Let's just treat it like it's any other historical book. And this might sound like this is sinful, um, that if we don't believe, if we don't assume the Bible is the word of God, then somehow our faith is lacking. But this is actually kind of a thought process you can do that allows you to examine the evidence in the same way anyone might, regardless of their prior assumptions. And if the evidence is strong, it'll back up the belief that, you know, in the New Testament, the portrait of Jesus as, you know, more than just a man and as someone who has special insight into God because he is God. Um, If those are things that can stand up to evidence without assuming anything special about the Bible and just letting the evidence speak for itself, that makes the faith in the Bible not something personal that I just have to believe, but it's something that is out there in the world that you can point to and say, see, um, you know, God has made this plain. He's given lots of reasons to back up that the New Testament accounts are the most accurate accounts of who Jesus is. And that therefore, because Jesus is who he is, um, I should listen to him because if he is God and if he rose from the dead, no other thinker you know, Nietzsche didn't do that. Marx didn't do that. Richard Dawkins didn't do that, you know, and so um, that, you know, that, that gives us reason for confidence. And, and those are statements that can be assessed using normal methods of historical inquiry. Um, so yeah, that would be, I think, on the truth side is just think about what are the standards for determining truth, especially in the historical sense, because Christianity is a historical religion. It's not a abstract set of ethical um, maxims. Like some, some, some religions are more that way, but Christianity is very historical. It's based on events that the Bible claims God did. And if God didn't do those things then Christianity is false. And so what are the historical tools that, don't require prior belief other than mostly common sense that we can use to look at the historical documents about Jesus in the Bible and elsewhere and say, you know, what's, how can we make the most sense about who Jesus is given normal historical investigation? That's great. Um, Because I mean, you got to realize that questioning whether or not the Bible is true was sort of how the early church interacted with it. It it wasn't that uh, Peter said, well, all scriptures breathed out by God and everybody's like, oh, well, okay. Um, Yeah, no, that that, that didn't, no no one else in the Roman world believed that except the Jews and the Jews um, needed to be convinced that Jesus was was the Messiah and rose from the dead. And so, yeah, so I think there was this idea, if you look at in Acts, there was a lot of um, 
a lot of looking for common ground, you know, with the Jews, they would reason from the Jewish scriptures to say, look, this is what you already believe. Look at how it points to Jesus. And then with the Gentiles, they wouldn't do that because the Gentiles didn't believe the Jewish scriptures. So they would look for common ground with the Gentiles and they would say, look, this is how you look at life. Let me show where there are holes and things that you already realize are missing that you don't have answers to. And let me show how Jesus provides answers. And by the way, he rose from the dead and were witnesses of that. So they could point to their actual tangible experience. Right. And, and once you establish that kind of truth and that, that importance, meaning is going to start to follow, right? So then we can start to ask questions about that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think it's good to keep truth, investigating truth, um, prime primary and let the meaning follow from that. There's a quote by C.S. Lewis that if you search for comfort, you will find neither truth nor comfort, but only wishful thinking and in the end despair. Huh. But if you look for truth, it's possible you may find comfort in the end. Now it's possible that the truth is not comforting. You know, it's possible that there is no God. And when you die, everything goes away and life sucks in the meantime, by the way. So good luck, <laughs> you know, or it's possible that there's a God who just hates us. And, you know, so, I mean, it's sometimes hard to separate my desire for comfort with an objective investigation of truth. But if Christianity is true, the good news is that the truth really is good news. It's immensely comforting, way more comforting than anything else, any other ideas really on offer right now. Um, and so I think, yeah, focusing on the truth first, but if Jesus is the son of God, if he rose from the dead, I think there are a lot of things that follow from that, that give a lot of meaning to life. Um, so for example, what are some questions that people deal with today? I mean, I think identity, significance, purpose, um, who, who isn't thinking about or talking about these things? And we all answer these things. And even I think as Christians, the sinful flesh infiltrates our sense of identity, where my identity is this thing that I can have confidence and this gives me value, but it's not God. Um, and so, you know, how, how, how does the truth of Jesus speak to those things? Well, identity, if we are God's masterpieces, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, then nobody else can say that we're junk and have any merit to what they say because the author of all things has said we're his masterpieces. And if we feel like we're not enough and, you know, you look in Romans 8, where it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He didn't even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How we not also give us all things. And if you feel like you're accused and that you're, you're not worthy, I mean, God has said you are worthy because of Jesus. So I think there are, or, you know, let's say, you know, I'm, I'm not accepted by my friends. You know, the Bible says, even if my mom and dad were to walk away from me, God is so faithful. He will never even do that. Even though the people closest to me, who I think I can depend on most, even if they were to do it, God is even more reliable and closer than that. And so I think there are a lot of these things where identity and significance and purpose, they really get back to relationships. Um, and what are, what are the relationships that feel like they give us value and love and affirmation? And people can do that to some extent, but if God is who Jesus revealed him to be, then um, that's a huge anchor for when life is hard and people are mean and you know, maybe the job search isn't going well and you start to wonder, do I have anything to offer? Um, so yeah, I, th I, th I, think, I think they're very closely related. And the cool thing that gets me excited is that I believe the good news about Jesus stands up to scrutiny as truth. And it also has immense resources for speaking to the aspects of life that make life worth living and that, you know, we all long for that meaning in life. That's, that, that's fantastic stuff. Um, David, is there any kind of closing thoughts before we kind of wrap up today? And, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this and sort of see where it, where it leads. But uh, thank you so much. Yeah, no, I think there's, there's plenty to unpack. But yeah, that, they, that, thank you. I, uh, I, I think this is something I'm passionate about talking about on both sides of this. I think, you know, my journey has dealt mostly with, well, can Christianity stand up to scrutiny, the truth side? But um, the last couple of years have taught me a lot more about, you know, it's more than just more than just truth. There's a lot about my heart 
that is at stake in, in my relationship with Jesus. And God has a lot that he wants to speak life into that. Yeah. So it's allowed to mean something to you, but it's, it's also allowed to be true so that it can mean something to you. Yes. That's, that's huge. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Thank you.